Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, uh, which will be delivered by Stu Hartley and is all about event insurance. I think we cleverly call this one Event Insurance 101. Um, insurance is one of those things that we find comes up quite quite regularly with clients. Um, it, obviously, depending on the scale of, of a client we're working with, some some clients obviously fully understand insurance. They know it upside down, inside out. Um, big promoters, for instance, they get it. Um, we can often find with with other clients um, that, especially when they're starting out, or if it's a first time event, or if it's a first time festival, um, we can find that they're not fully clued into, you know, insurance. What types of insurance they need? What types of insurance they should look at? Um, here in Ireland, we've got we've got a couple of event specific brokers um, that look after events um, and we try and we try and um, connect new clients with with those brokers early on in the process um, we had an experience a couple of years ago with a new client who was running a new festival who were they were very scared of even picking up the phone and, and talking to the insurance company um, and we had to we had to explain the importance of insurance the various types of insurance and encourage them to make the call and I'll never forget, I'll never forget the phone call I got back from that client. Um, very happy, very pleasantly surprised, very pleasantly surprised with the with the cost of the insurance was the main thing. It was nowhere near as much as they had expected and wasn't wasn't the problem um, they, they thought it was going to be, which was which was a great way to start a relationship like that. So they got a lot of cover sorted quite quickly, you know, didn't have to worry too much about it after that. Um, and I think that's one of the messages for me, definitely, when it comes to um, insurance is you cannot afford to bury your head in the sand, uh, make the call, get advice, look at what types of cover you should you should have. I know I, th I think Stu is going to look into various types of cover. There are certain things people don't think of sometimes. Um, and then there are things that um, are critical and you don't want to be left without. We may or may not get into debates about coronavirus and, and COVID and whether it's covered and things like that. I know there's a lot in the news around the world about insurance companies um, covering it or not covering it. I was delivering training this week and a section of it was on insurance and we got we got deep into into some of those issues and they can be quite they can become quite heated heated debate. So I'm looking forward to the session. Um I was going to say a usual story. I need to stop saying that because I know some of you guys may not have been with us on these webinars before. So very quickly, use the chat function over on the right to um, just to ask questions, to talk amongst yourselves, um, to get involved. Um, uh, we will track any questions that come up there, and we'll try and we'll try and get Stu to answer them or address them as best he can for you. Whether that's in the middle of the session, if it makes sense to do it, or whether it's at the end, we will do a, a Q and A at the end. Um, we'll also do what we've been doing lately, which is turn on the raise your hand to speak feature, which will let you um, press a button. We can give you permission to come in as a presenter in here, turn your mic on, turn your camera on if you want to ask a question. Um, like I always say, if you're very keen to ask your question and get an answer, that's probably the way to do it because we do like the interaction on the webinars. So if someone's willing to talk or turn the camera on or whatever, that, that works for everyone. Um, it breaks things up a bit, so it's, it's quite nice. No pressure, but the option will be there. Um, I want to thank Paul Griffin um, in Acto Events, who are supporting us as always with these. Uh, again, the infrastructure company, we're actually working a couple of events this weekend uh, with them. It, it's gonna be good to be to be back out on site and back doing stuff. Um, so that's that's them, that's Acto. So they've been really good to us. They've been, they've been keen to support um, and we're delighted to have them on board. Um, without further ado, I think it's pretty much all I need to say. So um, I'm going to get Stu to take over. Like I said, ask the questions, put them in the chat. We'll track them. We'll get answers for you if we can. Um, and I'll be back to talk to you in a little while. Um, Stu, if you're ready, you can press that big magic green button and, and take over there. Um, and I'll... Thanks for that, Mark. Appreciate the, uh, appreciate the, the intro. And... Uh... Hello, everybody, from beautiful New Zealand tonight. I thought I'd, uh, thought I'd, uh, thought I'd wear the All Blacks jersey. Um, but as you can quite quite clearly tell, I'm not a, 
I'm not a resident of these of these fine fine shows. Um, yeah, tonight I just wanted to uh, to give a um, a very brief. I won't be going into too much detail, but I appreciate that this is kind of the session that everybody was kind of looking forward to uh, to listening to. You know, there's nothing sexier than than a Mancunian talking about event insurance. I mean, I'm going to try and hopefully blow your mind today because um, you know this is what everyone was here for, really. So hopefully, I can give you a a very um, uh, kind of a a little bit more than a basic overview in respect of in respect of event insurance, and no doubt there will be some of you watching today who have had insurance or have had experience of insurance. But as Mark uh, alluded to earlier, you know there are some probably uh, insurance virgins who uh, who might need a little bit of a a steer going forward. And you know, um, knowledge is key. So, as I said, uh, it is it is ten p.m. here on Friday evening. Um, I'm in in Auckland on the uh, in the North Island of uh, New Zealand. And uh, for myself, it's a big kiora, which is uh, hello, and tinakoto, which is uh, which is greetings to uh, to all that are here today. Um, Aotearoa, New Zealand, is uh, the land of the long white cloud. And I've got a couple of apologies to make first. Um, my beanie, it is, uh, it's 10 p.m. It's, it's freezing cold. I've actually, I've actually had to, uh, to get a glass of, uh, you know, a wee dram tonight just to, uh, to keep me warm throughout this one. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got a bit of a, a storm going on outside as well. So hopefully the, hopefully the signal stays stays quite strong for the for the rest of the webinar. So what I want to kick off with today is just, you know, a very, uh, a very quick overview of, of who I am. Um, most of you probably wouldn't have come across uh, myself. Um, and I know that most of you are dialing in from from, you know, around the world. Um, but my name is Stu Hartley. Uh, as I said, my, my dulcet tones aren't, aren't Kiwi. Um, I'm originally from from Manchester. Uh, I immigrated here in in January 2011. Um, originally from uh, born and bred uh, in Oldham. So as you can see there, that's a, a beautiful picture of me. I think I'm like third from the back with no shirt on, swinging my shirt around my head. Um, no, that's um, that's the beautiful beautiful crowd at Oldham Athletic. Um, I'm a diehard diehard fan. And obviously, being over here, um, it's been pretty, pretty difficult uh, keeping track of of sport back home, especially for Oldham, who are languishing in the in the lower regions of the uh, of the football league. Um, but my background is is primarily uh, was film and television. Uh, I was a cameraman by trade. Uh, that's what I went to university for. That's what I studied for. And then I. Um, Worked in the industry for a number of years um, outside broadcast. Um, spent some time working, uh, interestingly, at the House of Parliament um, as a cameraman there, um, which was, you know, quite actually interesting. Um, Premier League football, um, F1, Grand Prix, um, and then, you know, as we do, I I fell into insurance, and um, you know, most people that you'll speak to in the insurance industry. We'll have a uh, a similar journey from another industry, and then and then and then happen upon insurance. Um, and when I moved here in 2011, there wasn't really um, I wasn't really looking to to stay within the industry. But as I said, I arrived here January 2011, and February 2011 we had the we had the catastrophic earthquakes in 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 Christchurch. So. Um, I got back into the insurance industry and taking my love of, of film and entertainment, what I've managed to do here over the last, uh, what is it now, nine years, is is kind of bring that love of, of entertainment, film, events, and, you know, expand that into my, into my knowledge and experience um, of insurance. And um, there we go, event cover. So... Event cover was formed in in 2018, 
And what what I felt at the time was that there wasn't a dedicated uh, specialist in New Zealand um, for the events industry. I was working as a broker at the time. Um, I've been working as a broker since 2011. I was specializing in event insurance. I was working with many, many uh, fantastic people within the industry. But for a broker, I had nowhere to go. I had to go into, into Australian markets. I had to go back into, into Lloyds of London. And I felt that there should be someone on the ground here in New Zealand who, who had the experience and had the knowledge and was able to underwrite the risk on the ground. So um, working with um, another company in the industry, we, we founded uh, Event Cover, which uh, still to this day, over two years later, is still New Zealand's only specialist underwriting agency focusing purely on the events industry. 100% New Zealand owned and operated. And the fantastic benefit of working with ourselves is that we are um, Lloyd's cover holders. So we work 100% exclusively on behalf of Lloyd's of London and we underwrite back into, back into the markets over there. Very, very quickly, a number of the events that we that we work on, some of them will be uh, familiar to, to those uh, here tonight. Um, obviously, some of them won't. Um, the big one there in the in the in the top left is the is the kind of crown in the jewels. We are very, very, very proud to be working on currently the 36th um, America's Cup. And um, Hopefully, fingers crossed, that still goes ahead um, towards the end of the year and into into twenty twenty one. A few other 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 mentions there. Um, the ASB Classic. It's a fantastic tennis tournament here in New Zealand, sitting on both the men's and the women's tour. Um, voted year in year out the best event on the tour, and that takes place in 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 January. Um, Six sixty. I'm not too sure how many of you guys here tonight. Are aware of this band, but it's a, a record-breaking band in New Zealand, um, blowing uh, ticket sales out of the water with their with their recent summer tour. Um, and again, we were we were proud to be involved in um, in that in that tour earlier in the year. And then there's a number of other uh, music festivals, um, sporting events, and uh, New Zealand Open as well, which we've been involved in from a, a hole-in-one um, insurance event. Uh, most of you, uh, most of you here, should should know where that is. Um, those of you who don't, um, that is that is Lloyd's of London. And the figure there that I've that I've uh, pointed out tonight um, is what we are being told are the total losses that Lloyd's have faced in respect of COVID. And my understanding is that one third of $4.3 billion is purely from um, event cancellation. So, um, you know, we all know that the types of events that have been that have been canceled. Uh, we'll probably get into further details and I'm really keen to, to you know, open the, open the conversation later in respect of, um, you know, some of these events. Um, Wimbledon, for example, has done the rounds in respect of um, what they were and weren't covered for. Um, so that's a really good example to use right there. Um, Mark, have you got something to add in respect of anything yeah, at the moment? Just while, just while you're mentioning cancellations, um, I, someone sent me a message here privately just wondering, and I'd wonder it myself, from an insurance perspective, we all know from an optics and from an organization perspective, there's a massive difference between cancellation versus postponement. So from an yeah. insurance perspective, when you talk about cancellations, are we literally talking about even if it's technically called postponed and they hope to have it next year or whatever, that there'll be a load of costs that probably have to be covered that, that the insurance will cover? Or in your world, is there in fact also a difference between cancellation and postponement the way we would think of it? Um, I'll get into it a little bit further in respect of what I'm gonna what I'm gonna talk about tonight. But yeah, I mean what we're finding is a lot of the events which have um, postponed to next year is just a cancellation because that event was going to go ahead next year anyway. 
Okay. So from an insurance perspective, um, there is a there, there, there is a fine line. A postponement may not carry the same loss that a po that a cancellation would have done, because maybe there would just be some additional costs in respect to putting it on next year. Um, but an insurance policy will cover cancellation, postponement, curtailment, relocation, rescheduling, for example. Um, what we're finding over here in New Zealand, and again, most of our talk. Most of what I'll talk about tonight will have that New Zealand steer, but you know, most people will be able to, you know, um, see some examples from where they are. Um, yeah. Most events in New Zealand weren't cancelled; they were they were going to go on next year. So, um, sorry, they weren't postponed; they were cancelled because they were going to go ahead next year anyway. Um, what they were trying to do is is not have to pay for the insurance for next year. They were trying to get this year's cover carried over to next year. That's what we're finding in New Zealand. Um, every event's different. We are, we all know that. Um, every every event will have the ability to postpone or not. Um, so it, it's it, it's very difficult, kind of putting a you know a carte blanche approach onto it. Um, every event will be different. You know, we all we all accept yeah. that. That's a good point, though. That a lot of you know what people may be turning. Uh, you know postponement or cancellation it, if it's an annual event and it was going to happen next year anyway and the next time you're going to host it will be next year that mm. is a cancellation of this year it might be that you're saying postponement as in we're going to have the same acts next year the lineup yep. will be this year's lineup but from your yep. perspective the reality is well next year it's going to happen anyway so yeah yeah i mean from an insurance perspective, yeah. yeah from an insurance perspective we would we, we would like to charge the premium for next year as well of course yeah. and we, we don't have the ability because you're trying to get that well some are trying to get that that free because they've paid for it this year yeah. <laughs> so it's been a it's been a lot of um, head scratching yeah i'm say. sure it's interesting conversations <laughs> <laughs> um, all right i'm gonna run away <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's um that's quite a key point i mean a lot of these um you know the, the wimbledon event was going to go ahead next year um Olympics is is a different beast. We all know that um, the Premier League, the NBA, um, they are they are seasons and they're tournaments, and they've got their own complexities regarding what can and can't happen. You know, they've got they've got deadlines that they've got to meet. They've got uh, schedules that they have to follow. They've got the TV the TV rights and so forth sat behind them. So each event is very very different. You know, South by Southwest one of the first to to cancel. Um, has it has it cancelled? Has it been postponed? You know, those are the those are the questions that we're all asking. Those are the the, the conversations that we're all having, and uh, you know, hopefully, I'll be able to go into a little bit further detail a little bit later. Um, what I really want to focus on tonight, um, as Mark mentioned, there's there's many many different types of insurance. Um, what I want to focus on tonight is is kind of the cancellation and abandonment aspect. Um, Yes, we'll have public liability. Yes, we'll have statutory liability. You may have employment liability and so forth. Um, insurance will differ, you know, wherever you are in the world. But for tonight's conversation, I just want to focus on the kind of basics, the insurance 101, um, the sexier side of insurance, as I like to say, in respect to the cancellation and abandonment. I mean, that's where the, that, that's where the money is made and that's where the money is lost. Um, so for, for tonight's conversation, that's kind of one way I want to, um, start to focus um, a beautiful a beautiful quote there um, from um, Mark himself I believe um, threats and risks are omnipresent and I thought that was I thought that was fantastic um, they are everywhere and I think what Mark was alluding to when he when he actually put that up a few weeks ago was along the lines of you know um, risks and threats don't change they're just added to and what we're going through at the moment globally is just another risk. Um, I'll go into further details about the elephant in the room towards the end of the the, the presentation. Um, you know, cum communicable diseases is, is the hottest of hot topics, so we'll touch base on that later. But it, it it just shows that you know risk is there. We all know that. We're all in the industry, um, and what I'm going to focus on tonight is just what a few of those risks are in respect of what could possibly you know, cause the cancellation, abandonment, postponement, etc. Um, cancellation, abandonment, the basics of, of how the insurance works is it's 
it's effectively a policy of indemnity. And for those in the room who are not aware of what indemnity is, it's looking to put you back in the same position as you were prior to um, an event happening. So what would have happened had the event gone ahead? Um, it's looking to effectively cover the the irrecoverable costs of putting on that event and or the net profit that would have been earned had that event gone ahead. So by putting you back in the same position, it's giving you the ability to either recoup the cost you've made or providing you with the option, um, and in the current climate, the option that you're kind of crying out for to keep the net profit that you would have earned and the insurance will effectively pay for the refund of the tickets, obviously, for, the, for, for these events. Um, what that does is, yes, put you back in the same position as you was before, but it's it's able to to make sure that you're you know that you can put it on again next year. The, the, that you're in the position to continue trading. Um, what we've found during this pandemic, certainly in New Zealand, and no doubt this is being felt throughout the rest of the world as well. This has just been catastrophic what we're going through. So there isn't the ability to to continue. You know, businesses have fallen by the wayside. Um, New Zealand's in a, a very very lucky position where where we're able to start trading again. You know, we're, we're, we're very, very fortunate here in New Zealand, hopefully Australia next, where we're able to, to start planning for next year. You know, we, we, we have no, um, we have no restrictions here in New Zealand. So we're in a, in a, in a fantastic position to be able to start planning. So those that, that are able, um, you know, we're now seeing, you know, um, events taking, you know, start selling tickets for in, in summer, for example, so um, if we're looking to be put back in the same position, then we need to focus on what those risks are. And the biggest one here in New Zealand, which is um, um, evident if you've ever been to New Zealand, um, and the, the famous song, uh, Four Seasons in One Day, is, is just spot on. It couldn't have been clearer. New Zealand has the most craziest weather system I've ever known. I mean, I'm from I'm from Manchester, and people in the chat earlier were talking about you know the the weather in Manchester. Um, I don't miss the weather in Manchester one bit, but the weather in New Zealand is absolutely madness. You can be on the beach in the morning, and you've got a cyclone coming through in the afternoon. Um, it, we are an island nation. Um, we are we're in the Pacific. We are at risk, um, unlike Australia, where you know everything's trying to eat you, um, everything can attack you. In New Zealand, we're on the we're on the ring of fire. You know, we're, we've got the we've got the earthquake exposure, um, and the weather is the biggest risk that we face in the events industry, um, especially for the majority of our risks will be will be outside. So, so adverse weather from an insurance perspective. Is, is triggered if the adverse weather makes it impossible prior to the event to set up the event, makes it impossible on the day of the event to continue because it could either be dangerous uh, for spectators, participants, or it causes a, a, a problem for the infrastructure, for the staging, for example. Or if the weather is too dangerous and the local government or the council, for example, um, you know, pulls the pin. That is when the adverse weather trigger on the policy would be would be uh, would, would be triggered. So it's either it's either too dangerous to continue, or we have um, a situation where it's just it's just impossible. And what the insurance policy will will look to do is put you back in the same position. So if the event had to be cancelled, if it had to be curtailed. Um, if it had to be a great example that I can use here is we had a, um, a local polo event, um, a very well-established um, international polo event it takes place um, annually here in Auckland, um, also in Christchurch. And there's also a um, one of the events takes place in Singapore. The, the event was due to take place in February. So that's the summer months here in New Zealand. 
And what happened was we had an ex-tropical uh, tropical cyclone come down from, from Fiji and dump an absolute ton of, of rain on Auckland. For a polo event, that meant that the that the pitch or the the uh, the stadium where they were where they were holding the event was was waterlogged. Therefore, it was it was then impossible to continue, and it was dangerous. It was dangerous from the perspective of the of the horses and the riders, um, but it was also dangerous for the for the for the spectators and the participants and people who were coming to the, coming to the event. What the insurance was able to do. Um, the last thing that these guys wanted to do was cancel. So what the insurance was able to do, and this is what a lot of people don't necessarily realize is, the insurance is there as a tool to make sure your event can go on. So the insurance kicked in because we'd hit the adverse weather trigger. And rather than having the event canceled, the insurance paid, so we paid out for that event to be moved. The event stayed on the same day. Um, I think we had four days notice to move it to a new venue. So we paid all the additional costs, all the advertising, all the infrastructure being moved, the new licenses, the new venue costs. We 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 covered all those costs and the event went ahead as if nothing had happened. There was no no downturn in revenue, no tickets were were refunded. Um, perfect pitch. It was a Ellerslie race course here in Auckland. So we'd gone from a, a catastrophic event taking place due to an adverse weather event then to be able to go to a you know a fantastic event and to be honest it was a again glorious day so we'd had an extra cool cyclone dump a ton of weather on a monday by saturday beautiful sunshine fantastic auckland summer and we had a you know um an amazing event on a world scale so the insurance is 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 to pick up the pieces you know that's my that's my kind of catchphrase. I pick up the pieces when it rains on your parade. Um, and that's what it's there for. You know, it's the catastrophic losses that, like, like we've seen currently, for the cancellations, for the postponements, for the rescheduling. Um, but it's also there to, to be used as a tool to make sure that you're able to continue. That could be putting an outdoor event indoors. That could be um, providing, um, you know, a flooring for an outdoor event. Um, any additional costs in order to make sure that event goes ahead that is effectively what the insurance is, is there for. That is a key point that not many people, especially here in New Zealand, are aware of. Um, this is quite an interesting um, peril that, um, that you all could appreciate wasn't really, really relevant for us here in New Zealand. Um, March 2019, as you're probably all, all aware, um, we had our first and only uh, terrorist attack on these shores. And whilst uh, we as a, um, as, a, as a nation were probably a little bit naive to the risks that the rest of the world were going through in respect of terrorism, it just wasn't on these shores. So we we really didn't pay, pay that much attention. You know, we were the, we were the safe haven. At the, at the bottom end of the world. And um, from an insurance perspective, I was giving it away as a complimentary level of cover. It was a, it was a freebie. It was a throw-in. Um, it was often, and, it, and this is really scary to, uh, to kind of look back on, it was often a, an aspect of the cover that people, even though it was given away for, for free, complimentary, that a lot of event professionals actually, you know, asked, well, you know, how much does it cost if I remove that? You know, is there any savings to take the terrorism out? Looking back, that's horrifying. Um, you know, the world is a totally different place now um, in respect of terrorism for us here in New Zealand. Um, but the dark day back in March was really a kick in the ass for us here. And it really brought New Zealand um, onto kind of a... Um, not a level playing field, but kind of brought us into that arena um, whereby this particular peril or this particular risk wasn't necessarily something that we 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 spoke about or that we had conversations about um, or that we were necessarily aware of. Yes, we have had some very, very large events here in New Zealand and no doubt that they did have um, elements of, of risk in respect to terrorism. We had the Rugby World Cup um, back in 2011. You know, we've had um, the cricket 
part of the uh, some part of the cricket world cup take place here as well um we have extremely large international music artists um make their way down here finally over the last probably five or six years so you know there is there is um what's perceived as risk in respect of terrorism here but prior to last year it wasn't really here but what is the risk for terrorism um how does insurance come into play and you know um, what what do we insure for um like adverse weather if there is an event which causes the cancellation postponement relocation of an event um due to terrorism then the insurance kicks in um what we do here in new zealand and again um th this is a type of cover which is readily available um around the world is we have either a global um terrorist cover or we have the local threat and what we refer to it as is time and distance terrorism insurance. And what that means is the insurance will cover you if there is either a, an act of terrorism at the location itself or the, or the, um, the venue, or if there is a, um, an act of terrorism which causes the, very, very key point there on the screen, the necessary cancellation um, of that event within a radius of, let's just say 50K, um, 80 kilometers away and within a certain time period of let's say 30 or 50 days so if there's an attack on the venue or if there's an attack within a certain time and distance from that from that venue then the policy will will kick in the insurance will pay out if there is a necessary cancellation what's very very good is the fact that we now have um, examples that we can now fall back on due to what happened last year. So we're in a better position to be able to underwrite those risks as well as, as, well as talk about those risks. Um, we had an attack in Christchurch. Um, there was multiple fatalities from a single um, an active assailant. Christchurch, for those, that don't, those of you that don't know, is on the South Island. Um, New Zealand is, is, is two large islands. Um, there was, off the back of that Christchurch attack, which was a Friday afternoon, um, there was events due to take place the Friday night. Uh, I believe Brian Adams was playing in in, in, in Christchurch. That was cancelled, obviously. Um, I believe it was in the uh, the the cordon. So that was a no-brainer. That could not have gone ahead. The the Canterbury Crusaders, who are the who are the rugby team, um, they were playing down in Dunedin, um, right at the bottom of the South Island, um, and that was cancelled due to the fact that it was a um, morally deemed to be um, you know, it shouldn't have gone ahead. Um, and everyone kind of agreed with that. Up in Auckland, here in the North Island, um, as well as Hamilton and many other cities in, in New Zealand, across that weekend and probably for maybe maybe seven to ten days afterwards, there was a, a significant number of events which were cancelled. And again, the, the examples we can use now is, is um, they, they were effectively not insured. Um, it wasn't that we... Um, we as insurers um, decided that that you know the the claim wasn't um, wasn't correct, or you know we tried to to get out of paying those claims. Um, the the key point was was it necessary to 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 cancel those to those events? Um, we had a number of events that that we insured ourselves at Event Cover, which were were up in Auckland. And the decisions were made that they just didn't feel that it was right to continue. Um, they felt that they didn't want armed police uh, patrolling some of those events. They felt that they couldn't go ahead because some of the police, um, some of the police from Auckland had to be to be um, to be sent down to the South Island. So they felt that they couldn't uh, continue with those events. But the questions we were asking when we were going through the, the forensic analysis and the forensic examination of those of those claims and those claims that came through to us was, was it deemed necessary to cancel? Now, the terrorism cover provides cover if there is threat. And, and as we all know, um, threat can either be um, a threat and nothing comes of it, or it can be a threat and then there is an attack afterwards. Um, whether the, there is an event or not, as soon as there is a threat, then 
the insurance effectively kicks in as long as that threat is you know quantified by the police or the government um you got something to jump in there mark yeah just a couple of people are kind of asking the same kind of question around the necessary cancellation thing who's involved in that actual decision um and there was a query that's similar about whether if a local authority cancels an event or the promoter cancels it so when it comes to making decision to cancel and deciding what was necessary who's at that table or, or who does it ultimately fall to <sighs> The example I'm using here, um, without naming names of the the specific event, yeah. it was a it, it was a cultural event, and the attack in Christchurch was at a mosque, so it had a uh, it had a um, kind of a racist element to the attack. Um, it was carried out by a lone white a gunman, and he'd posted. Um, footage on Facebook and I, I believe it was actually live when the attack happened um, there was a number of um, uh, let's just say kind of gossip went around the country in respect of um, unqualified threats to other um, minority events in New Zealand so the particular event that I'm referring to here was a minority cultural Polynesian celebration they deemed that that they were at risk. That was their call. They deemed that that they were possibly under under threat. Um, the police had received no threat whatsoever to this particular event. They had received no information to say that there was any threat to any other event or any anyone else within New Zealand. They had the lone gunman. They didn't believe there was anyone else involved. At that stage, the insurance isn't kicking in yet because there was no received threat for that particular um, for that particular uh, event that we were involved in, and many many others around the country. Um, the government had not received any information in respect of um, any threat to any other events. Um, so when we start talking about was it necessary, um, no one's questioning the fact that the promoter or the event organizer deemed it necessary under the insurance it's quite clear that did the attack stop that event taking place because there was a clear and present danger um, yes necessary isn't isn't necessarily defined within the policy and it can be quite you know ambiguous in respect of you know um, is it or is it not necessary um, it's not a straightforward answer in respect of claim is denied there's a lot of conversation that, that that takes place in respect of many parties, police, government, promoters, yeah. um, insurance, loss of jobs, and so forth. I guess it's important from the organizer or the promoter's perspective, if they're even thinking along these lines, that that line of communication with you guys as the, or the insurer is open immediately. Mm. And these discussions are happening and they're fully understanding. Let, like, let's be honest, we, we all get insurance cover, whether we fully understand it until we absolutely need to, mm. um, we, we probably don't. So if something yeah. like this is happening and you're, you're wondering about whether your event can go ahead, this is key. you're probably the first phone call. Here, here is key, and this is, this is what I want to um, um, make note of at the end in the summary. The best piece of advice to take away from this is, is form a relationship with a specific broker or direct insurer like ourselves, who knows this like the back of their hand. Because when the shit hits the fan and you have to make decisions because you have an event, whether that's a, um, an adverse weather event, whether you've got an earthquake, whether you've got a, you know, a fire, anything along those lines, um, there, 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 there could always be a way to continue. The loss adjuster will come in and work with you on behalf of the insurer to make sure that you've that you've you you've you've looked at every avenue in order to 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 continue that's interesting actually and we might come back to that at the end because it's come up a little bit in the chat but okay. i'd never even, i would never even have thought in those terms either about engaging with the insurance company and then being able to like what you, as you described for the polo event they pay for it to happen somewhere else that yeah. that's how your insurance kicks in yeah. it's not either pay out because we cancelled but they can actually facilitate the event going ahead but just happening somewhere else I, I wouldn't even have thought of that it's quite interesting yeah 
the the insurance the insurance is up to a certain limit and the limit is usually your your cost and expenses or your gross revenue um obviously cost and expenses plus net profit gross revenue um up to the same limit the the policy will also cover mitigation costs so effectively we're we're spending a dollar to save a dollar and we all yeah. know if there's a cancellation if there's a cancellation there's usually savings so you'll never go to a full cancellation you'll never go to your two million dollars or what you've been ever insured for because there's there's co cost savings by not holding the event um but again a lot of people um are just not aware of because there's there's not a lot of conversation going on probably in respect of insurance um of what it can be used for in order to make sure it goes ahead because at the end of the that's day yeah, we all want it we all want it to go ahead yeah no that's good i'm going to go away now and let you continue someone oh. did ask in the chat actually about the cover level and if it was just to cover costs incurred or if profit was in there too yeah uh, or yeah. is that a conversation yeah. you have to have with the insurer to try and get profit covered so that did come yeah. up as well it's again we can touch on it in the q a but it really depends what you feel your risk is you know okay. the conversation should be had early in respect of you know what are you looking to cover for because what is the risk yeah it comes down to being open like the same as we say about all insurance be open and honest have a conversation and as you say and i think it's a good point because it, it happens everywhere else in the industry but maybe we don't think of it happening with our insurance people develop a relationship actually know those people be able to pick up the phone text them talk to them run things by them if you have that and they know the industry they'll know that well we could try this because this works for this other event and it's not this thing and you ring them once you get the cover and you hope you never have to talk to them again it's key i mean i would say i'm probably stick to the back teeth in respect of somebody phoning me up and saying hey how much does it cost to get this every event is different an event promoter knows that their event is is, is so far removed from the guys next door every event in New Zealand, especially, has a different risk. Indoor, outdoor, time of year. Yeah. Um, is it is it in an earthquake zone? Is it not in an earthquake zone? Um, what is the weather like for that time of year? You know, do we do we have a again going back to to the terrorism aspect? Do we have a threat of terrorism? Is it is it an event which is on the world scale? Um, is it on the world stage? Um, do we have an overseas artist coming into New Zealand? Do we have an artist who has underlying health conditions you know there's all there's all different types of risk therefore there is a there is there is you know how long is a piece of string um is very very true in respect of how much does it cost to ensure an event every risk is different that's why um it's great that that point has been brought up in respect of you know forming those relationships early find somebody in the industry um in the insurance industry who like myself you know i don't i don't refer to myself as working in insurance i i refer to myself and what we do here at event cover as a as a um a supplier to the events industry um we've worked bloody hard to kind of change that stigma in respect of us now feeling that we are um firstly the authority within new zealand in respect to event insurance but secondly you know part of your industry you know we 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 bled like you have bled in respect of you know no events for us is is no business um large losses large claims they have they all have a, um, an impact on on our bottom line as well um so you know we have felt this this downturn um as much as anyone else but there's where the relationships are you know um we've been able to call upon um our peers within the industry you know to make sure that they're okay you know to see how see what's happened see what's gone on see what we can do see if we can possibly provide some advice and that is key in respect to forming that relationship with a with a, a, a broker um in the uk for the majority of you guys that are probably in the uk um you're very 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 fortunate that you know that's that's the hub that's where it happens um here in new zealand the whole reason why we set up event cover was because there just wasn't that specialism um, yes, we've got you know the guys over in Australia. Yes, we do very, work very very closely with London, but there was nobody here in, in, on the ground in NZ um, who was really looking to penetrate the industry um, to really understand what the risks are, um, and that's key. It's, it's having that conversation with somebody who actually understands just how goddamn sexy this industry is, understands what the risks are, um, and 
works with you transparently, clearly from day one in respect of, um, you know, providing you with the cover that you that you probably never even knew you could get or could have. Um, as I said before, um, risks are omnipresent. They're everywhere. We, working in the industry, you know, we know what could, you know, put pay to an event. Um, the big ones there that I've just mentioned, you know, we've got the adverse weather. Um, we've got the terrorism, which has now, you know, shown its ugly head here in New Zealand. Um, the other big one there is, is is natural disaster. You know, we aren't, we're known as the shaky isles. You know, we have thousands of earthquakes per day. We don't feel them. Um, they go undetected. Um, but New Zealand is shaking uh, on a daily basis. Um, since 2000 and I think it was since 2001, um, we've had around eight earthquakes which have been felt over a level six on the MMI scale. And that is the the, the kind of sideways shaking. And what that means is, and I, think, I believe it's anything over, over a six will cause you know, um, significant damage or damage to buildings and so forth. Um, here in New Zealand, we're an island nation. Um, we're on the Pacific Rim. Yes, we have the tsunami risk. Um, we've got the earthquake risk, obviously being there on the uh, on the earthquake zone on the on the plate. Um, Auckland itself, um, twenty seven uh, volcano rims. If you've been lucky enough to come to New Zealand, um, right out in the harbour in Auckland, we've got Rangitoto Island which is um, an absolute beautiful volcano, if there could be one. Um, it, it is dormant, I believe, I hope. Um, but we literally are in the shadow of, of a huge volcano and 27 of them um, around us. So these are other risks that, that we are you know, constantly faced with. Um, we're looking at events. We've had the forest fires over in Australia, um, unprecedented uh, losses there. The adverse weather will obviously bring um, flooding as well, and then we've got the standard stuff—the standard stuff that we that we that we kind of you know take for granted sometimes. You know, the electricity failure, the gas failure, the venue being you know um, unavailable because they've had a fire. You know, many many examples of the slightest the slightest little issue in respect to an electrical failure and the event is cancelled. Um, equipment failure, breakdown, equipment not being able to get to an event on time. You know, we see that a lot from an insurance perspective in respect of what is the risk of a touring artist coming to NZ. Yes, we have the the risk of the the artist themselves, or the or the group, or the or the sports team, or the sports stars. Uh, we refer to that as non-appearance insurance. So effectively, what we're, what we're covering there is the perils of you know death, accident, and travel delay. Um, a really good example that that I like to use here when I'm when I'm talking about event insurance is Elton John, the most uninsurable man on earth. Like he will cost an absolute fortune to insure. I wouldn't touch him with a barge pole. He's, he's, he's just is too much of a liability in respect of his historical um, historical losses in respect of um, firstly his health and then uh, and then secondly his his just demeanor. I can't be bothered turning up today. I don't want to go on stage. Um, that's uninsurable. Um, so there, so there's the risk as well in respect of you know the person risk. But you know if we've got a touring artist coming to over to New Zealand, anything could happen between Auckland and Hamilton, between Hamilton and Christchurch in the South Island, for example. You know you could have transport delays, car failures. You know we could have um, quarantine issues in respect of getting into New Zealand. New Zealand is renowned for stopping you at the border. If you've got an apple, you know, if you've got any fruit or vegetables which have not been declared because they could seemingly um, kill our our natural environment. So we are quite stringent in respect of, you know, what comes in. Therefore, you know, we could have um, we could have equipment for a music festival which just gets stuck at the border. What happens then? We've we've had examples whereby we've had. Uh, heavy uh, heavy metal rock bands playing here in West Auckland, who got to the got to the venue, um, you know, two and a half, three thousand people in a small indoor venue, and they've got no equipment. And literally, they had to go onto Facebook 
to put a call out to the local masses to um, to get people to bring equipment. And, and interestingly, you know, we had like Slayer, for example, play with locals' equipment. Absolute madness. And um, those additional costs to bring that equipment in would have been covered, as per what we said before, as a as kind of a mitigation cost. So again, ways and means in respect of uh, making sure the event goes ahead. Um, unusable venue facilities, you know, sometimes we have, uh, we had an example here whereby we had a venue under construction, it had some redevelopment on it, and we had a, a quite a significant fire. So what that meant was the events which had been booked in to take place in that, it's the new International Convention Centre here in Auckland, um, couldn't go ahead. So they've had to be moved an entire year, year and a half, because we had, um, you know, a facility which was which was in the course of construction, which again had to, um, you know, had some issues. We had a fire there, so those had to be moved. So there's many, many, many different risks in respect of running events. You're all aware of those. It's just making sure that you are um, those are top of mind in respect of when you're having these conversations regarding event insurance. What isn't insured? Um, I've gone through a couple of examples there. What is? Um, what's excluded? We've got radiation, you know, standard exclusion under under any event cancellation policy. Um, pollution, seepage, contamination. Uh, war is quite an important one. Um, it's a usual exclusion under any um, event insurance policy, but it can be written back in. So you effectively pay extra money and you can write that back in again. Um, same with uh, civil commotion, unrest, riot, martial law. Um, you can actually purchase that insurance back in, standard exclusion, pay a little bit extra, um, and then writing it back in again, you're effectively putting that insurance back into the policy. So if the event is um, cancelled, postponed, if you have to curtail it, you know, if there's a if if if, if there's a rescheduling matter um, in respect of you know some some form of civil commotion, the insurance policy will pay out or again cover those mitigation costs in respect of possibly moving it somewhere elsewhere. Financial failure is a is a is a key one. Um, there's a condition precedent to the insurance and a you know a quite a key condition that you know this event will go on on. All contracts are signed. We have you know enough financial support in order to run this event. And if there is financial failure, unfortunately that's that's kind of on you. That's a standard exclusion under there. Again, failure to supply or failure to sell enough tickets, sorry. Um, standard exclusion under the policy. Um, terrorism, usual exclusion, as I said, you can rewrite it back in again. Um, national mourning is, a, is quite a key one as well. Um, in the UK, we're, we're obviously got a, um, you know, a very established royal family in respect of, you know, they're kind of getting on a little bit. Um, but what national mourning will cover you for is, you know, if, if, if there's a death of the, um, of the queen, um, or a member of the royal family, and the country goes into a, a, a state of mourning. Um, but that could also be a state of mourning fo following, let's just say, an earthquake, for example, or a terrorist attack, um, which we have seen in the UK previously, where the country kind of just kind of just grounds to a halt a little bit, you know, pays their respects, and then, and then carries on. So if there is an event which is cancelled or, or postponed because of that, then we will we will pay out. Um, artist non-appearance again as I spoke about it can be rewritten back in and then you know this is what you're all here for probably tonight and we've probably we've probably had a had many many conversations um, communicable disease so it is kind of the elephant in the room um, I think it does need to be to be spoke about and I'll go into a little bit of you know brief details of why I think it needs to be spoke about um, it needs to be spoke about because it wasn't spoke about um, I believe these these are my rough estimates that probably ninety seven percent of events taking place in New Zealand didn't have insurance, and the three percent that did, probably ninety seven percent of those didn't take out communicable disease cover. Communicable disease cover was an exclusion, and it could be written back in again. Um, the exclusion was standard across every single event cancellation policy on earth. But as far as I'm aware, and certainly over here in New Zealand, it was always an option prior to this being a known event to be purchased back. It was 
pennies. It was dirt cheap. And I don't recall having many conversations myself with promoters, with event professionals in respect of this being a risk. I think we've all got to appreciate in hindsight that this wasn't really on anyone's agenda. You know, we didn't really see this coming. From an event perspective, it certainly, well, correct me if I'm wrong here, and we'll have this conversation, it wasn't really a risk. We didn't have a conversation. Um, some events did take out communicable disease cover here in New Zealand, and they took it out purely because they just took everything out. It was a kind of a carte blanche approach. It was a, it was a macro approach whereby they just insured everything. Um, didn't know what they were insuring, they just wanted the full cover, so that was insured. Um, I've got one example here in New Zealand who specifically asked for communicable disease cover, and it was the best $1,000 they've ever spent because that $1,000 extra they paid has just covered the $2 million loss that they suffered here in New Zealand. Now, they took it out because communicable disease, as you can see there in the definition, is classified as or a definition of any disease capable of being transmitted from an infected person or species to a susceptible host, directly or indirectly. Now, the example I'm using here is this particular um, international congress took it out specifically for mad cow disease. They were in the veterinary space, and they believed that if there was a global issue regarding a mad cow disease type of um, pandemic, then all the vets who were due to fly to New Zealand wouldn't be able to attend. And that was the key and the only reason why they paid the extra. And that has just triggered when the event was cancelled due to COVID-19. I know of two events here in New Zealand, one for ourselves and one for a, a, a rival insurer of ours over in Australia, two events in New Zealand who had cover for the pandemic that we're going through now. It just wasn't discussed. And as I said, a very, very, very small percentage, unbeknown, probably purchased it. And an even smaller percentage of people purchased it for, for you know, for a very specific reason. If they did purchase it prior to it being classified as a, a known event, then they would have been insured. But unfortunately, once it's classified as a known event, it's then no longer unforeseeable. It's a it's known. So therefore, you can't insure it. Insurance is there for the unforeseen. Um, the analogy that I'm using now is that the house is already on fire and you're phoning up the insurance company to get, you know, house insurance. Um, the boat has sailed, you know, the horse has run. Um, communicable disease for the foreseeable future will not be available. Lloyd's, as I said earlier, and this is just Lloyd's itself, um, has suffered a loss close to about 1.5 billion. Um, that number will be will be way, way, way above that. Um, but those are the numbers which were released, uh, you know, maybe a week or so ago. Um, the losses are still being felt. A lot of syndicates in London don't necessarily know where those losses are going to end up. Um, you know, we've seen the likes of Wimbledon, and no doubt we'll we'll have a quick chat about that. Um, we've seen the Olympics go. You know, we've seen other huge losses um, in the event space, and the losses from a a money to monetary perspective are significant. We've seen syndicates in Lloyd's, um, underwriters in Lloyd's who have pulled up stumps and gone home. Um, they've, they've, they've closed down their contingency event teams. They've been, all been made redundant. The losses they've suffered, uh, you know, they can't come back from that. So um, we've seen syndicates that we that we work with personally pull away and pull back, um, close, close for the day. Um, so this is a, um, it's a wake-up call. This is the conversation we're having in New Zealand. It is a it is a slap across the face in respect of what is the risk of running an event. And I think what it if if anything good will come of this for those events which will which will hopefully continue, it will just make people more aware. It will certainly make people more aware of insurance. It will certainly make people more aware of how to uh, transfer that risk over to insurance. But it'll also make people aware of what 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 risk is in general. Um, it's it's ensuring the unpredictable and building those relationships and having those conversations at the start are key. They really are. 
it's ever changing. Um, if you're going to take anything away from today, it's build those relationships. Um, have conversations early. Unfortunately, what we're going to see because of those significant losses is the rates are going to go through the roof. Um, capacity is going to be diminished. It's going to be, it's going to be harder to get insurance going forward. That's not to say impossible. It will be impossible for the foreseeable future to get cover for communicable disease or, or COVID or pandemic. Um, but that will change. We, we kind of saw it after 9-11 in respect of terrorism. Um, that will come back again. I think we just have to kind of you know wait and see where that ends up in respect of losses. Um, this has had a, a, you know, a significant effect on the events industry. Um, there's no question about that. Um, but what it has also done is, is kind of given us a chance or time to kind of step back a little bit, to, to recharge those batteries, to, to re rethink, regroup, um, have conversations like this. This series and these, these, these presentations have been, have been nothing short of, you know, hopefully people will take value from, from everything that, you know, a snippet of what I've said tonight, but everything that, that, that's kind of gone before me, um, it's gold, it's pure knowledge, um, which you can't get elsewhere. So, you know, huge thanks again to Mark for... And kind of, to kind of step back, to regroup, to, to have a look at our industry and in, in all honesty, you know, make it better. Um, what I'm just going to leave you with just very, very briefly, um, I don't know whether Mark wants to step in and, and press play on this video or, or I can do it myself, but there's a fantastic video produced here in New Zealand. What it does is it, it shows how beautiful this country is. But again, it just touches upon what I've just said there, just time to kind of settle. We're all going to come back for this. You know, we will come back stronger. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, what we say here in New Zealand is kia kaha, which is, which is stay strong. Um, I'll just, I'll just hopefully put this little, uh, little video on and, uh, and then we'll touch base afterwards. Stop. Listen, Papa Tuanuku, the earth brother, is breathing. Stop. Tamaki Makoto. Listen, Papa Tuanuku, the earth brother, is breathing. El Moonga, El Mountains, standing strong. Our Moana, our ocean now louder than ever. Our Tui and our Kedidu now need not fight with the daily hum of our busy lifestyles. Our people's wilder, normally loud and joyful, now soft and distant, waiting for the right time to rise again. Our land renewing, replenishing, ready for your return. And our kai, our food, preparing to nourish. Enjoy time with your whanau, your families, your loved ones, and soon we'll unite again. Noho tafiti tu kotahi. Sit at a distance, stand as one. We, our land, our waters, our people, we aren't going anywhere. Dream, plan. And when the time is right, we welcome you. But for now, listen. Papa Tuanuku is breathing.
Well, that was quite nice. That was a, a good way to finish up, I think. Um, Stu, thank you for that. I think, just looking at the chat and stuff, I think, you know, you've, you've maybe uh, prompted people to, to think about the, how they approach insurance a little different, maybe. Um, there was a question. I don't think we can answer it because I think your answer will be there are too many variables, but Chris was hoping you might be able to give um, some different types of cover needed and examples of cost for like indoor versus outdoor, 100 people versus 50,000 people. Um, I think there's probably too many variables. And as you said, it changes. It, but anything you can do on that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it does. It depends what type of event. So, I mean, if, if it was Chris, um, if Chris has got the, the type of event, um, you know, we've got the rates are the same across the world. Um, and it depends what you're insuring. So let's go back to, you know, are you insuring your costs and expenses or are you insuring your costs and expenses, pushing net profit? Where do you want to be? Um, what's your risk? Where do you want to be at the end of the day? If you have to, if you have to make a claim, um, the rate for an indoor cancellation, let's just use mu music event taking in place indoors compared to outdoors um, music event indoors should be sitting around, I reckon about, 0.5 percent so 0 0.50 percent times against what your what your what your limit will be um compared to an outdoor event which um you know here in new zealand taking in, into account the adverse weather um you could be talking two percent so, so it could be two percent of the amount you need to cover basically is what you no, no, no. So you'd be you effectively million dollars times two percent yeah. equals your cost okay. It so over a million dollars in a potential payout. Correct. Correct. So your insured limit is your gross revenue, which will be, you know, full traps reverse, you know, ticket sales, sponsorship, uh, food and beverage, so forth, so forth. Um, times whatever the rate will be equals the equals the premium you're gonna pay, push your push your you know, local taxes and so forth. And it really depends the type of event. It depends what the trigger is. You know, what's the trigger for a um, an outdoor music festival in respect to cancellation compared to a football match. Rain or shine football match, go ahead. It's in, it's in a stadium. Um, if it becomes dangerous for the people to get there, that's usually the way, you know, I've, I, can't, I can't recall a referee stopping a game because it was dangerous for the players. It's usually, it's called off prior to the game because of ice or, you know, people can't get to the stadium. You know, you, you know that more than me. Compared to a, a polo event, Whereby the horses can't can't play on a particular you know type of field or something like that. Again, compared to tennis, whereby any water on the court stops the game. Um, and then you and then you're really looking at what the terms and conditions of the ticket refunds are. Therefore, in respect of what you're actually insuring. So my example for tennis is the ticket refund was if you've not seen an hour's play in the session you've purchased, you get a refund. So as soon as you see 61 minutes worth of play, you don't get a refund if it's cancelled after 62. Um, if there's water on that court, we all know with tennis, they, they don't play. Um, yeah. Same with cricket, you know, so forth and so forth. So it depends what the trigger is as well. So a lot of variables, but yeah. overall, about 0.5 for indoor, about 2% for, for an outdoor music. That's that's interesting, actually. I'd, I'd nearly forgotten that. We had a, a cricket client a few years ago, and we, very, with the bad weather here in Ireland, we very quickly got into understanding what that trigger was. And I, and I actually forget it, but it was a certain number of, of overs had to be played before can and it, calling it off. It goes down. I mean, the risk will, yeah. um, I think the right word is am amortize or something like that. The risk gets yeah. lower the, the, the further you've gone. So um, that's probably what the terms and conditions of the ticket refund is. At the end of the day, the biggest thing over here for all the events which were cancelled and those that didn't have insurance, it's not so much that they've lost money, that they've, you know, um, might not be able to continue. It's the knock-on effects of the brand. They've not been able to refund. And that's the big, that's that's the key one. That's what's hit the hit the press and the um, the newspapers around the world. It's all these events which have not had the ability to refund. Yeah, That's the key. So you want to be able to refund. So most of the time you'd insure for your gross profit, your gross revenue. 
because you want the ability at least to refund it to be able to on tickets because in all honesty you've spent that money on the event so you want to give that money back you don't have it you've spent it the yeah, costs have been done so you want to be able to refund and that's the that's the biggest thing i know a few events in europe have run into a bit of trouble where where they've had to postpone and they've what they've tried to do is basically hold on to ticket payers money and give them a valid ticket for the next event or the reschedule or whatever and i know there's been a few court cases i think one was in holland where it was ruled that you have to give them back their money if they want it back you yeah. can all you can of course offer a first option of look your ticket will be valid and that's what lots of promoters do and if you got a good uptake on that maybe you can stay in business but if every single person asks for their money back the ruling was you'd have to you'd have to give them their money back so it can be yeah and we're finding easier. we're finding more and more you know you've got the, the force majeure um, yeah. clause which we're all aware of and we're all aware of it until you actually have to then call upon the force majeure and then you're like what well, is, is am i covered am i not how does it work um, you put in place an insurance policy that is forget the force majeure. It's how have we triggered? So what we're finding over here now is a lot of a lot of our clients specifically are the terms and conditions refer back to the insurance policy. Right. So as long as the as long as the insurance policy pays out, we can refund you. And it's dependent on that. It's then it then gets a little bit tricky because then people are trying to understand how the hell the insurance policy works. And it's not always in in layman's terms. Yeah. Um but if the event promoter is clearly understanding what they are and aren't covered for, then they can effectively put their terms and conditions in a in a, uh, a format that's that's understood. It's that joined up thinking thing, so that every part of the house is talking to one another, so that without a doubt, fighting. yeah. And a lot of people just said, to be honest, a lot of people just cut and paste and copy T's and C's. So oh yeah, oh huge, huge. And then and then to to be honest, when I when I asked the question of a promoter, what what are your T's and C's? it's um what's the biggest one i get um it depends it's like it's up to the um what's the word it's up to the promoter's discretion whether they refund or not yeah. that is that is so that's vague that's like what what is yeah. that is that i don't even know if that's legal um but at the end of the day there is no reason to because when i hear that i know full well they've never had insurance right because if they did then there'd be that um there'd be that link the bit that you know joined up riding in respect to everyone would be on the same page andrew has a i think a nice summary here he goes so in summary during an incident where the organizer is thinking about stopping an event going ahead the advice is pull up another chair for the insurance broker and include them in the loop well yes. yeah even way before that you should he's probably there but i think if you've right got if you've, if, yeah. if you've if you've got that relationship you've given free tickets to the broker and the insurer anyway so you know what i'm saying like we're it's we're there um, no, but in reality you know we we're not involved in running the event you know and we're not event professionals yeah. in respect of you know put, putting on these events but hopefully that relationship's there in respect of we know that you know when you need to pull up stumps the last thing that a promoter wants to do is cancel yeah. and they will they will try everything possible to make sure that event goes ahead we know that yeah okay we've had some instances whereby they've pulled up stumps way too early and then we're having to kind of you know backtrack as to well we didn't hit the weather trigger where why did you cancel you know who who made that call um why was you using a fijian weather data to get your information from when if you look out the window it's not even uh, raining you know what i mean so we've had yeah. we've had those conversations but in in that in that particular example there i mean that's a, that's a real example um that particular promoter he's far more knowledgeable now than he was prior he was he had no relationship with his broker again going back to the point all insurance brokers don't know event insurance 99.9 .9 percent of the event broke um insurance brokers don't know your industry don't know our industry yeah. therefore how can they advise on it you've yeah. got to find the diamonds in the rough you've got to form that relationship with a specialist um i think chris had a question here i think you've kind of covered uh, what percentage of policies would actually have covered the pandemic as you said it was a standard exclusion um, it was a standard exclusion. It's known, it, yeah. you know not it for a long time will you be getting it covered it was standard exclusion but, you could. but it was always available to write back in again and those that did were covered 
Yeah. Wimbledon, great example. Yeah. Wimbledon is the example that is going around the world. Um, just between me and you, you might know more about here, the six other people that are here, don't yeah. believe the numbers. I've never, no, I'd imagine that, no, yeah. I've never actually heard any more about that story as regards, do we actually know what prompted them to take out that cover? I've never heard that bit of the story. I know it existed and the numbers that are real are not real, but do we know why, do you know, have you heard in industry why that, they, again, was it a case it was in their, I heard they asked for it specifically, which again, may or may not be true. That's what I read. So I'm wondering what um, prompted them to do it. I wouldn't have been surprised if they would have specifically asked for it. Yeah. Purely due to the fact that they probably asked for everything as well. Right. War, terrorism. Give me everything I can everything have, there. please. Yeah. What, what, is, what is covered, what isn't? How much does it cost? As I said, for pennies, you could have insured communicable disease on every single uh, policy. It was not, it, you know, it was um, 0.05%, something like that. It was, it was, it it was nothing. Make or break um, anything, probably. So the numbers that are in the press in respect of how much they paid and how much they were paid out isn't, isn't correct because it wouldn't have cost them that much anyway. Um, but they are probably um, on an even playing field in respect of the larger events in the world probably did take it out. Um, right. It's pro because they've got probably an, an in-house risk specialist who knows insurance more than, more than most. Um, plus also... They've got a specialist insurance broker. Yeah, that's going to help. Peter has a question here that I don't fully understand, but maybe you do. He says, does ACC in New Zealand have a positive effect on getting insurance for events? Do you know what ACC is? Um, yeah, yeah. So ACC, no? just to explain to everybody else, is the Accident Compensation Fund. So unlike in the UK, everywhere else, we don't have a litigious society. Okay. You trip, slip, fall on your ass, you're not going straight to your broker and trying to sue somebody. Um, what happens is any injury in New Zealand is covered by this fund. Um, you know, so it's a it's a pool. It was set up by the government um, back when. What that means is that we aren't um, insuring ourselves for injury under public liability, so there's no risk. Okay. So public liability is only for third party damage, um, and I believe anything that falls out of ACC, so stress stress related injuries, um, which never really happened. Um, so ACC makes it easier to get insurance in New Zealand because there isn't the risk of injury like you would have in the UK or um, Australia or the US, for example. So quite a key point, public liability here in New Zealand is if, or general liability is just property damage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, that, that's interesting. Yeah. Good man, Peter. I know that, yeah. I know that particular Peter. Uh, good man. Um, so... Sorry, Raymond says, so I presume that a rapid response in some cases would be required to confirm the decision to cancel. So having a broker on hand or at the end of a Zoom or telephone call, is that an arrangement that you should be confirming during the planning of the policy? Or as you say, if you have a decent, if you develop a decent relationship with your broker, mm. should I have the confidence that if I'm getting nervy and I'm starting to shit myself, that I can ring them, Zoom them, whatever. That's the type of level of relationship you're talking about, isn't it? That you're uh, very quick. I I, I I lock out the 1st to the 19th of January every single year. That is booked out because that is the dates of the ASB Classic here in New Zealand. And for the past nine years, as the tennis event, for the yeah. past nine years, I've effectively been on call for yes. that event because I am literally on the end of a phone. When I was their broker and now I'm their insurer, um, I'm on the end of a phone call. And I literally have been midnight, the event director, Stu, if I cancel now, are we insured? Right. No, you are not. Hold off. Wait. So that's, Wait. that's the level of engagement you're talking about. Correct. Because the, the, the call there is very important. If they call off, they've got to refund everybody in that stadium and, and, and not refund. Uh, so not be able to claim because it's not covered. Um, so I'm literally end of a phone call. Not making that decision for them. I'm talking them through how the policy reacts they make the call. Um, if they have to make the call, they make the call. Yeah. Um, we will do everything possible to make sure that that, that we can either um, cover that loss or cover the mitigation cost. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, John is wondering, any, this is a tough one, any advice for suppliers working with organizers planning for events in the future 
where we know there might be second waves and organizers won't be insured for cancellation due to COVID. So can they um, still, is, is that actually, is that true? Is there any distinction there? They'd be insuring. Can you insure for cancellation and that cancellation could be caused by COVID or the government saying, right, we're locking down again. For instance, if the government locks down, does my cancellation insurance kick in because I now can't have it? No. Anything COVID related? It depends when you purchase happen. insurance. Okay. Correct. Anything directly or indirectly related to COVID. If you purchased it prior to, it was like the 20, whenever the World Health Organization classified it as a pandemic, that's when Lloyd's or most insurers around the world said it was known. Prior to that, okay. if you purchase it, it will cover you for this. Um, you can't purchase it now. So anything that happens now that you purchased afterwards is not is not covered. You've just got a blanket exclusion. Um, it's a, a good point there. Suppliers. Um, suppliers could actually insure themselves for the cancellation of the event because a supplier can't make the promoter take out the insurance. Yeah. And sometimes you're not paid up front, you're paid after the event. You, you certainly hire over here in New Zealand. Yeah. If, they, if they can't pay you because they've not covered themselves, you're screwed. You're, so you're way I, down the line. So can, as a supplier, that's, that's fast. Actually, that's very interesting. So let, as a supplier, could I take out cancellation insurance in case the event is cancelled, irrespective of why it's cancelled? So... The promoter might cancel because of COVID and he could be screwed because he couldn't get COVID cover. But can I just take out cancellation cover because he he has to cancel irrespective of why he makes that call, if you get me? Because as you said, I'm not involved in that decision. It'd be the same policy that he takes out that you would take out. Okay. What would be the different... If he's taking out insurance, you're covered because his costs and expenses and his net profit is insured. Therefore your revenue as the supplier should be covered. Is, is covered. But if he's not, you have that. You should be having that conversation as a supplier with whoever you're supplying to because your revenue is important to you. Yeah. Your revenue can be insured, irrespective of whether he's insured. Um, you, know, you, you can insure yourself. So you, Matt, yeah. can take out cover for your company doing what you do to cover yeah. your revenue from that event. And it would be the same trigger points as as he would, as so again, would, we, would we run into the same issue theoretically then in that if COVID is the reason it's cancelled, he's not covered, I'm not covered. Yeah. That's so not covered. If, yeah. So if it's if it's anything to do with a cancellation due to COVID, as of now, no one's going to be able to get cover for it. Whether no. that's me covering my ass, supplying all the barriers to him or him covering his no. entire festival, if COVID causes it, no one's paying it, basically. And the difficulty is um, Lloyd's itself put in place basically like seven or eight exclusions in respect of covid yeah so it was it was so there was no gap in the exclusion they excluded everything possibly that you could think of which was indirectly linked to covid now it's basically just says covid or sars whatever it is known as yeah. any anything Actual. yes boom done yeah. that's also you've also got the communicable disease exclusion which covers every other communicable disease so they kind of double excluded it yeah. um that I believe will be for a while, a long time. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Chris is wondering. This is good, actually. From from a presentation of risk, do you find that promoters underplay the risks or don't understand the risks? You know, in order to try and save on the premium. You know the way we all uh, tell the insurance company our motorbikes are definitely locked and garaged overnight, just to save a few quid on a premium. Um. You. you... Or is your job to really tease that out, get right into it, and fully understand it, even if they don't? Um, the the client has a material; um, they have to disclose a material fact. Yeah. So by not disclosing information, will be will have a knock on effect if that claim's accepted or not. Right. If you've told us that your stage is covered on three sides and has a roof on, and you know has a wind tolerance rating of blah blah blah. And it doesn't, and the event is cancelled due to the fact that it's hit 50k sustained wind and it blew over. We ain't paying. You've you've you know you've lied. Um, but at the end of the day, the information we need is you you complete a proposal form. You provide all the information. We need a copy of your you know event management plan, health and safety. Yeah. You know we need information from the likes of yourself, Mark, in respect of you know how it's been managed correctly and so forth. Copy of the budget. 
Um, it's that transparency. Yeah. Um, yes, we have had instances where we've had information missed, i.e. he was a dentist, but he also did events on the side. That's not an event organizer. He's a dentist. Um, so the level of experience is quite key in respect of, you know, managing events correctly. Um, so, yeah, transparency is key. Don't try and withhold information. It's probably going to bite you in the ass at the end of the day anyway. Yeah, it's got that potential, isn't it? Camilla makes a good point there. She goes, I used to tour with a sports entertainment brand doing outdoor shows. We would often have our broker on the road or at least a local assessor at the shows, which is good. I mean, I know it happened in Ireland with our litigious nature started happening at big festivals a few years ago that the insurance brokers and the assessors are on site. And that you know they're now they're now another porta cabin and they're now another radio and they're responding to things as well to gather that first hand information that will help them as opposed to maybe relying on you know second third fourth hand reports they're on site themselves for the, the days of the festival to get that straight from the horse's mouth I guess as it were it can be quite key I mean for weather data for weather at the moment I mean we use the most robust weather data known to man I mean we're using artificial intelligence. Um, some amazing company, one particular company in the UK that we work with, yeah. who provides data for 10 years in the future. Um, and, you know, we, we will underwrite a risk based on that information. So our rates are determined from the weather data that we pull out of the system because it is so, so advanced. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so again, when it comes to a claim, we'll, we'll fall back on that, on that weather data as well. You know, what was the, what was the rainfall? You know, what was the sustained, sustained wind speed? What was the gust? That, that, that type of stuff. But being on the ground, you, 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 you can't beat that because it's, um, you know, it's, we're there and then, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to tell people that if they have any last burning questions, throw them in. Cause I think I'm hitting the last couple here. Um, so Peter's wondering, could the insurance company or the broker influence the cancellation of the event um and affect the safe operations of the event i mean again it, it, that you're talking about a relationship that's a little bit more genuine and, and true mm. than, than that i guess in theory you could have an insurance broker being a dick and trying to you know either scaremonger or but again could you really if the event what's the benefit yeah, yeah i mean that's, you're, you're that's... you need events happening and being covered to make money you know the the again we 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 hope that our peers in the industry the last thing that they want is the, to cancel an event yeah we know there are some bad eggs and we know that you know probably events are cancelled when they shouldn't have been cancelled because it's maybe the easier option or, or they're trying yeah. to get out of it or you know they're trying to do an ins insurance scam um it will bite you in the ass i mean the forensic examination that goes on or can go on after a claim is you know, it is forensic. Up, yeah. you'll, get, you'll get a lot a loss of just to come and become your best friend and want to know <laughs> chapter and verse. I mean yeah. it's not it's not it's not that tedious, but it can be if there is a a whiff of something dodgy going on. At the end of the day, what was your loss? You know, was the policy triggered? Okay, cool, that's accepted. What's your loss? Let's come to a negotiation in respect of where we want to end up in respect of the figures. What do you want? And then we pay you. Done. Simple. And it can be that easy. Yeah. Or it can be difficult because there's information, you know, withheld. People are being misled. A decision was made which was not necessary. Um, we've had that. In, we've, we've, we've all seen those instances where events yeah. have been pulled and we thought, why? That was, that was, that was crazy. Um, we've also seen the opposite where events have gone ahead and they shouldn't have done. I think that wording is, is quite key that the, not just thinking in terms of cancellation, but as, as you have it there, necessary cancellation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, I think we've all know, we either know of, or we've definitely heard the stories of, you know, that promoter who, you know, things aren't going well anyway, and maybe sees an opportunity and thinks it's a, mm. it's a, it's an easy way out. And maybe he'll, yeah. he could get the cost covered with the insurance and he doesn't lose his ass on it. Uh, so yeah. those things happen as well. But I think, mm. as you said, if you're, if you're straight up, if you're open, if you're building that relationship, um, that can only stand to you. At the end of the day, as I had a different conversation, it wasn't about insurance, with someone recently about professional indemnity insurance and stuff like that. I mean, if you if you ask the professional and you follow their advice, the level of cover you have then, because they are the professional and they advised you to turn left and you turned left, but it went wrong. I mean, that mm -hmm. level of cover is significant because yeah. 
they're the professional. If you made that decision yourself, you could be hung out to dry. But that's why, you know, you involve these people and you get professional advice. And even if you guys on your end don't fully understand it, it's a bit new. Like a lot of it is still a little subjective. But the fact that you're doing the advising, I get to say I took out the cover the way he advised. I give him all the right information. This is what he told me to take out. Here's where we are. I should be able to sleep at night thinking like I'm, I'm done. I'm covered. You know, Stu has me sorted. I don't need to be stressing about this. And at the end of the day, the, uh, the broker is the intermediary providing you advice. Yep. I'm the insurer. I take that information from you and your broker and I underwrite the risk that's presented to, to, to the best of my knowledge. That's interesting. The, insur broker, yeah. the insurance broker carries their own insurance in respect of the advice they provide. Yeah. If they tell you incorrectly to do something, you're going after them. Yeah. That's the reason why they've got insurance to cover their own ass for the advice they provide. So it's quite key making sure that you're working with the correct people who have the correct knowledge and experience and understanding of what you do. A broker can't advise you on an event if they don't understand the risk of an event from an insurance perspective. Make sure you speak to specialists who understand contingency event insurance. Um, you shouldn't go wrong. <laughs> Sorry, my daughter's getting impatient now. Um... <laughs> Okay, super. Okay, no one's jumped in with any last minute questions. What I made a note of something I need to say. Oh, a few. Sorry, this isn't to do with you, Stu. A few people have messaged me wondering about attendance certs for I think the last two webinars. Uh, we've just been really busy, guys, and we haven't got to do them yet. Um, hopefully over the weekend I'll get those sorted and they'll appear out. So don't worry about them. And a couple of people had to disappear early into other meetings from this. So yes, there there will be a recording. You may take it that all of these are recorded. Um, unless technology messes us up, we record them all, and within a couple of days, we should have them up there on our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to catch up on them. I know a lot of people when they have to leave, bang on the hour, they catch up on on the last bit. So, Stu, from me, thank you very much. I think I I definitely understand insurance a little bit more, and I think what I'm really taking away is that pick up the phone, have the conversations, um, develop that relationship with people who know the sector specifically, um. And that's the thing we've run into here in Ireland, that there are brokers you can go to and there are people you can talk to and they'll they'll come up with some cover and they'll take a premium off you. But do they know the industry? Do they know how things play out in court? That yep. needs to come into your thinking. I mean, and it's mm. tough. When a new company sets up here doing insurance cover, they tend to try and poach people from the established ones mm. to have that credibility and understanding quite quickly. Yeah. And I think that's probably yep. the only way to do it. You need to understand our industry to try and advise properly and how to cover mm. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's quite key. I mean, there's there's many associations around the world and we're trying to penetrate the associations because I think it's quite key. The information should be coming down from the top. Um, you know, associations provide some form of value sometimes. Um, and we're finding that the association should be the, the first point of call. As a, an event professional, you should go, okay, I'm, I'm part of this association. Who can I speak to? You know, are there are there advisors that I can speak to? Who who understands our industry, and they should be putting you in touch with the right people, um, or just pick up the phone. Yeah, come and see me in New Zealand. For, you know. Yeah, and just don't be don't be don't be burying your head in the sand. That's always my advice with the insurance. They can be, yeah. you know, it, no yeah. one wants to think about it really. They can be awkward conversations. You can have lots of things to fill in, but like, you're not going to go ahead. You shouldn't go ahead without knowing you're covered for the things you need to be covered for. And in my limited experience, generally I find that people are pleasantly surprised that insurance doesn't cost them what they expect it to cost them. Um, I mean, I've, you know, I'm not, I've, I don't insure events, so I have no skin in this game, but that is clients' responses, generally speaking, is that it didn't cost what they thought it would cost to get properly covered. No, I'm not going to say it's cheap. It's cheaper than you, than you think, so that's, that's a good point, Mark. Is value it oh it, it shouldn't be the last line I, I, I see a lot of budgets for events it's it, <laughs> it's, 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 it's at the bottom you know and then you just think hallelujah it's there it's the first line on some of them event insurance bang because they know full well or don't be that event promoter who goes I had my event cancelled last year so I'm getting insurance now it's like you know the horse is bolted you know you should be of the frame of mind where I want to take it out you know um yeah but hey we can't we can't you know we can't always get our way but no, hey, it's, we're, it's a constant battle <laughs> it is it is it is 
Um, all right, listen, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the session. I hope you enjoyed the the, the wee dram. Um, thank you. I know it's late over there um, and you didn't even bat an eyelid when I wanted to keep to the 11 o'clock on a Friday schedule. You said, yeah, it'll be 10 o'clock here, but I'll figure it out. Um, That's good. So I appreciate that. Uh, I think everyone else appreciates it. Thanks, guys, in the chat for getting involved and asking the questions. Um, and everyone have a good weekend. Thanks, too. Cheers, man. Cheers, guys. Bye.